absolutely um, wild experience. And I say wild because I think it, mm. it both communicates some of the incredible, incredibly good things that happened, but also some of the incredibly painful and almost surreal moments that I still look back on going, did that actually happen? Um, and again, both for the worse and for the better. Yeah. Welcome to the Together Podcast, where we're figuring out life together. And if this is your first time, an extra big welcome to you. Today we are asking the question, what does it look like to grow as people? What is it that helps us become better versions of ourselves? Now, if you look back over the last three years in your life, have you faced a significant challenge of some sort? Most likely, yes, and perhaps more than one. But just think about who you were before that challenge, that struggle. Are you the same person now? Interesting question. And another one, maybe even more interesting, if given the choice between the struggle and the growth that came out of that and an easier option, which would you choose? Today we are talking to Luke Williams about this exact topic and he shares some very insightful thoughts on what success really is and how his view of success has changed recently. And he talks about reaching our potential what holds us back and at the end he talks about what he believes a life well lived looks like let's go to that interview now so luke good to have you with us yeah um thank you for agreeing happy to be here can you just tell us why you think you've been asked to be on this podcast um, other than nepotism, seeing as we are related, I am your brother-in-law, <laughs> um, so obviously preferential treatment. Uh, I I don't know. Um, uh, I like I don't know. I like conversation with people. I'm really interested in people, and so um, having listened to a couple of, of your podcasts, I, it sparked my interest. And then you asked me, and I thought, um, yeah, I'd love to. You told me that you listened, and I did say on the, one of the podcasts, I think, that if you were listening, you were a candidate. Oh, there you go. So, cool. it, it's definitely true. It's true. But I think, Luke, you do have some things to share, so keep listening. Um, what have you learned about yourself uh, over the course of your 30-something years? 30-something? Uh, 35, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not ashamed of my age. What have I learned? Uh, I was talking to people about this recently, and... If I was to kind of bookmark my life so far, it would very much be um, my teenage years, 10 to 20s, was very much like, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I didn't care what I didn't know. So I just was having a go at everything, having a lot of fun, just loved it. My 20s um, was a decade of everything that I thought I knew. I just, I genuinely believed that I knew everything. Yeah. It, it was It was that dumb, naive arrogance, and my 30s have been, so far, just this wonderfully painful realisation of how little I actually know. Right. Where yeah. do you think that... I don't think everyone would say they felt like they knew everything. Where do you think that came from in those, those young adult years? Uh, I think... Th th uh, I just... I had a lot of self-confidence growing up, and I think it's because I had a wonderful family, not a perfect family, but I had a wonderful family who believed in me, who gave me every opportunity. I had wonderful friends and mentors and just people speaking into my life, and I think maybe I just started believing a bit too much of what they were saying, mm. that they were probably encouraging me, and well, they were, and I think maybe I just started believing too much of what was being said about me, and I ran with that. Um, yep. Yeah. So I think that's probably where it came from. Would you say you'd had success early on? 
it, it, it felt like success when I was in it, but looking back on it now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it great success, but, um, but there was, there were people's lives that were changed, um, in part at least because of what I was involved with. So that's how I'd reflect on it now. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, it felt like things were moving. I was achieving something. Um, yeah. Must have been a good feeling at the time. Yeah. Oh, great yeah. feeling. I mean, it's, it was my, my late teens and early 20s and all my 20s. And so you want to mm -hmm. take on the world. And um, so a lot of it felt good. Um, there was obviously some painful parts too, but yeah. Do you think, what do you think? If that had continued for the rest of your life? Would that have been okay? No. That, like, no. I actually get scared thinking about that. Really? The, legitimately scared thinking about what I, would, what I would have become had I not had a few significant life events that have revealed to me more recently that there's still so much for me to learn. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about one of those events or something that's changed that perspective? Yeah, I, I think... Um, I was a pastor in a church for about 15 years, two churches, five years in one and about nine years in another, and absolutely um, wild experience. And I say wild because I think it, mm. it both communicates some of the incredible, incredibly good things that happened, but also some of the incredibly painful and almost surreal moments that I still look back on going, did that actually happen? Um, and again, both for the worse and for the better. Wow. I think um, I had always had a life script that I was going to be a pastor. That's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a minister in a church and for the rest of my life. And if I'm honest, I heard of pastors finishing up and not being pastors anymore. And I just thought that was strange. Mm -hmm. I thought in my arrogance, I thought they didn't make it. You know, um, they they pulled out short. They, you know, but now I see that one of the most significant events for me was when I finished up being a pastor, and um, life started to be very different, and I started seeing things very differently. That, that's one event of many that happened all at the same time. Mm. But but I just started recognizing when I was taken out of that context and out of that role, and my identity was no longer you're a pastor, it was, I had to start questioning, well, who am I? Where am I finding value now? Mm -hmm. um, I started to ask a lot more questions. And um, if, I, if I go back to your original question, what have I learned about myself now? What I've learned is I, I much prefer to be curious than overly confident about, about things. Um, I, think, I think often in my experience of some of my life and potentially in the church, we spoke far too confidently of things that we probably need to be more curious about. Mm. Um, and that's what I've learned about myself, that, that I do better when I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. So, how's your relationship with that dream of being a pastor now? Are you, do you still... Has your idea of being what a pastor is changed or has you dropped that mm. goal completely? Uh, I think what's shifted is not the word pastor. What I've come to realize is that I had attributed my identity to a title of pastor because of what our culture um, in the West has attributed to the title pastor. There's esteem, there is almost fame or there's this untouchableness to these pastors because we hold them up in such high regard as if they're untouchable and and I probably deep down wanted to be that um, whereas now where I am in a Monday to Friday job um, what hasn't changed is the fact that God has called me to be a pastor he has wired me to be a pastor but what I now understand that to be is so radically different to what I acted as for 15 years mm. that for me pastoring is that he's actually developed in me uh, a desire and at least a small level of skill in being interested in people, um, being aware of people's needs and that being aware of their emotional level and then wanting to um, care for them, make sure that they are contributing the best they can. And so as a pastor now, 
it's not a title anymore. Yeah. It's just an understanding that God has wired me in a way that I go, I am pastoral. Some people aren't pastoral. Some people are just efficient and tasked, and they've got these wonderful skills that our world needs. Uh, but I realize now as a pastor, it's not how many people are listening to me. It's now um, well, how, how many people can I listen to? It's I, I undertake the role without the title. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, really enjoying that wow. revelation and what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So that's you've dismantled a lot of what you were aiming for yeah. in your younger life. Yeah. Would you say you've got new goals now? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Radically different. Radically different. Uh, I think I think I had I had two sets of goals and I was thinking about this and I want to speak personally because I thought, oh, I think everybody has two sets of goals, but I'll speak for myself. I think I had two sets of goals. I had my spoken goals, my external goals, and my internal unconscious goals. Mm-hmm. And my spoken goals were, I want to... Uh, make sure people are cared for. I want to make sure that people know about Jesus. I want to um, help you know people find home in the church. Whereas my unspoken goals, I think, were my authentic, were my more authentic goals, which were, um, I want people to know about me. I want mm-hmm. people to think that I'm really good. I want people to think that I'm better than the next pastor, or I want people to like our church more than other churches. And and. It even just sounds ugly saying that now. So, so those were my goals back then. Now, uh, I'm just finding these. I'm finding the goal, like the ordinary goals, the most satisfying. And I don't even like the word ordinary, but it's the best word I got at this point. And what I mean by that is, I, I, my new goal is so centered around family that um, I want my kids to grow up and be um, joyful. Mm-hmm. I want my kids to grow up and be emotionally capable to feel the world, but also know how to handle their feelings mm-hmm. and communicate their feelings. I want my kids to grow up assertive, knowing that they can ask for what they want, but also stable enough to know that if they don't get what they want, they're okay. They can adapt. I want, I want to build a like a, a, a marriage that my wife and I love being a part of. I want to build a family that even when we're older, my kids actually want to be around me. You know, when they're 20, 30, they actually like being around their parents. Mm-hmm. Not all the time, but um, my goals are now so much more. Um, I want to be a good neighbor to the person who lives next to me. Um, I want to just treat people well. Mm-hmm. Um, and... And I have, it sounds ironic, I'm sharing them on a podcast, but, um, but I, have, I have no need to um, put those goals out into the world and let people know about them so that they go, oh, wow, look what Luke's achieved. I go, mm-hmm. I'm sharing them because you've asked me. But anyway, I think they're more goals in secret and I find that mm-hmm. pretty satisfying. Yeah. I think there'd be a lot of people, maybe younger, but I think other people that do have big aspirational goals that you know are looking for the prestige and the title or mm. the the accolades maybe unconsciously um and like you said you'd heard about pastors retiring early and things mm. like that but obviously there wasn't anything that oh that's not me you probably thought that and maybe someone's listening to you now and they do you think Listening is enough for people to, you know, yes, I'll go for a simpler life. I'll, I really look inside and know those aren't really the things I want. Or do you mm. think you need to go through a bit of heartache and yeah, wow. that crashing down for you to realise that? Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I hope that they don't need to go through the heartache. I'm genuinely convinced that there are some people on the planet who can go after the big audacious goals and the big, crazy, everybody knows about kind of success and they can still do it with a humble heart. Like, I do believe that's possible. I'm not sure if it's possible for me at the moment because I'm still a recovering, yep. probably narcissist in some degree, if I'm just being <laughs> bluntly. But, so I do think it's possible to go after the big stuff with a humble heart. Um, is it possible without going through the heartache to go, actually, yeah, 
the simplicity needs to be enough. I hope, I hope so. Uh, and all I've got to go on is there have been times where I have sat in a conversation where somebody has said something or I've sat in a church service or I've sat in a lecture mm -hmm. and I've heard someone from the front say something or even the person next to me say something and it's stuck enough for me to go, hmm, actually I think I need to live by that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope it's possible. Yeah, good. Yeah. That's encouraging to hear. <laughs> well, try and listen to some of what you're saying then, Luke. Um, for a lot of people, and some of what you're talking about, a great goal would just to be the best version of themselves as they can be. Yeah. Um, be content with who they are. Mm. Be honest with that, you know, not needing to be somebody they're not. Yeah. Um, what does... What do you say personal growth looks like and how does, how does that happen best? Yeah, I think, I think in my dealings with people over the last 20 years, I think personal growth is a lot tougher than people think it is and think it's going to be. I think I've certainly found it tougher than I thought it was going to be. Um, Yeah. Just what it, what does it look like? Yeah. What tell me about the environment where the ideal environment for somebody to be growing and healthy. Yeah. How could you set that up? Yeah, I think I mean ultimately it's got to start with a desire. Like at at, at some point we've got to go all right, I need to do something. Like until until a person in and of themselves makes the decision to go I'd like to grow, I'm not sure how much further we can get until that, that mm -hmm. point comes. Now, I think people can encourage them to be growing before that person makes a decision, absolutely, and, and maybe it's the encouragement of other people that prompts them to go, all right, I need to do something, or I want to grow. But until that person chooses to grow, we're fighting an uphill battle to try and grow them in any other way. So I think a desire to grow, and then for me, I think people just become crucial. People around us. I, I, I just don't believe we exist on our own. Um, I'm gutted that there is, a, there is such a s strong sense of loneliness for so many people um, because I just go, life wasn't meant to be done alone. And I don't think personal growth was meant to be done alone. So I think ideal environment is when people belong to a community, and that word can look like a whole number of different things. But when they've got people around them, but they need a couple of different people, they need, and if you can get this, if you can get people who have both of these things, mm. you're really doing well. But if you can get people who have at least one, make sure you've got one of each. Yeah. And simply put, it's just truth and love. Mm. That I think we need people who love us genuinely, no mm. matter what. People who you call them in the middle of the mm -hmm. night at 2 a.m. going, I've made a mistake, and it doesn't matter what the mistake is, mm -hmm. you know they're going to answer the phone, and you know they're not going to judge you, and mm -hmm. they will, they love you. Mm -hmm. And they love you enough to want to see you grow. But you also need the people who are going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Now, ideally, <laughs> we've got the people who love telling us the truth, and it's just blunt and it hurts. Mm -hmm. If we can find people who genuinely get the balance between truth and love, yeah. And they go, I love you no matter what. And because I love you no matter what, I know how to, and I'm going to work hard at figuring out the best way to communicate to you the truth that I know will help, but I'm going to do it in a way that I think is going to lift you up rather than mm -hmm. condemn you. Um, so I think we need people who get, get that balance well. And they're hard to, in my experience, I think they're hard to find. It's a special kind of person. It's a special and kind of person. I guess it's a challenge for us to be somebody like that for other people too. I was just thinking, I hope, <laughs> I genuinely hope that if I ask the people in my life, they would say that of me, but if I'm honest, I, I don't know. Mm. I don't know if I would. I might be a little bit weak on the truth-telling part. I like being the nice guy mm. and I probably need to tell the truth a bit more um, in those moments. But anyway, I think that's ideal for, for growth. Um, for a person. Mm. Certainly what, what has helped me the most is people in my life being people who I know accept me no matter what and yeah. yet believe in me enough to go but I also want to mm. 
tell you the truth and see you grow. That's pretty good. I reckon that's that's takeaway right there. <laughs> you take one thing away. <laughs> find someone like that, and if you find them, hold on to them. <laughs> hold on to them. <laughs> yep. um, so, what do you think? Talking about growth, also comes to mind the word potential. Mm. And everybody, I look at young people, so much potential. Yeah. And one of the things that makes me sad is seeing people not reach their potential for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. What do you think have been barriers for you? And what do you think are common barriers that you see in your work with other people um, to reaching that potential? I'll just speak personally. Um, I don't want to assume I know too many. Personally, uh, it sounds so cliche, but I think fear is a really big barrier. Um, hmm. And probably as simple as just the fear to try. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm learning about success is that the more I see the successful people, and that's a really loaded word, they're legitimately just people who weren't scared to try and they weren't scared to fail mm -hmm. and they tried and then they failed again. Like it, it legitimately is, I mean, I think of so many different, yeah, I mean, you look at the Steve Jobs of the world or the Elon Musks or the M&Ms, like depending on what mm -hmm. category you, you follow, business, music, celebrities, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, like you hear all their stories and they all started out the same way. They tried and they failed. They tried this and they failed. Mm. And, and I think for me, not reaching our potential is, for me, was a combination of um, I just was too scared to try something and put myself out into the world for fear of what might happen, mm -hmm. rather than just put a, bit of, put a bit of yourself out into the world and get some feedback from it. And maybe it goes horribly wrong. Great. Like, yeah. that's your feedback. Now try something else. Put yeah. a little bit more of yourself out in the world. I don't know that's so much easier to say than it is to do. I'm talking about myself. I haven't done it. I'm hoping to grow in this area of my life where I go, look, just, just try mm. something. Because I think reaching our potential happens when we just make a commitment going, I'm just going to keep trying. Mm. Like, what if that's life? That my life is a series of tries that, that at some point there's going to be a, a, yeah, actually that, that worked or... I got some feedback from that and I want to tweak that a little bit. Um, mm. it, yeah, I, I think a blockage to reaching our potential for me has been just a fear to just try and get feedback from the world um, and then try again. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. So I guess being humble enough to fail at things. Yeah. Like looking at what you described you were, sounds like you were, had instant success in what you started off with. Would you say that was roughly oh. correct? As in when I was well, a young a pastor? People, you sort of fell into it and sure. it, it would look like for many people... From the outside looking in. They may aspire to that and work towards that for many years. Sure, yep. So outside looking in, it might look like yeah. you fell into that. But would you describe uh, that... That period in your life is successful, or your potential? Uh, not, not by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. I mean, back, back then, yes, I think I was discovering who I was and the potential that I could reach. Um, yeah, but I, but I think there was. I don't know. It's hard not to look back in hindsight. Right. Okay, there was just so much potential that I can see now that I've missed the opportunity of. Yeah. Um, but back then it probably felt like we're nailing this, we're killing this everything's, right. you know can you see any, can give me an example of something that you thought was going really well but you look back and thought we could have done different well I mean I was running a youth ministry so we had you know young people and I had a, le a team of youth leaders who were just fantastic and we didn't have you know it wasn't like we were perfect but we had young people coming to a program. We had young people coming to camps. They were having a fun time. They mm -hmm. were, you know, um, and, but, but I look back and I go, but, but were we reaching our potential? Did we really treat people well? Did we really treat the young people well? Did I really treat my team well? Or was I just part 
of a system that was trying to keep something running and keep something getting bigger and bigger and making sure the numbers got bigger. And I think the potential that I saw was this feels good because we're seeing exciting things happen. But now I look back going, but the potential to really treat people well, I think we, we may have missed okay. at times. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot I wish I could go back and do differently going, Ooh. no, no, I can't. I've learned a lot from that time, so I'm grateful for that time. But, but there was some potential that I can see now that we may have missed, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I guess in everything there's, there's good and bad. Of course, I'm sure absolutely. There was many people that you did treat well and helped and people would thank you. Yeah, um, definitely. And, and I don't want to dismiss that for a second. Hmm. There was, you know, I... Um, I, I can't deny the fact that in spite of me sometimes, with me sometimes, and with others sometimes, God, I believe God genuinely changed people's lives in those early years mm-hmm. when I was a pastor. And, uh, and so I'm grateful for, for, those, for those stories as well that mm-hmm. still are true today. So, if you could sum it all up, <clears throat> from what you know so far, what do you think a life well lived looks like? What's life all about? <laughs> Yeah, I love, a, a I small love question. That's right. I love that you're rephrasing what's the meaning of life question. <laughs> like it's not, you know, the question that Deborah's asking. Yeah, uh, what does a life well lived look like? That's the question. As I thought about as I yeah, as I thought about that question, I thought um I'm in this current season of life personally and with the people around me I'm just constantly reminded that everybody's going through stuff um, I've got mates who have um, stuff at work that's really difficult I've got friends whose husbands are really sick at the moment mm. I've got um, there are friends whose marriages are just doing it tough um, and and then there's stuff in my own life where Relationships are just not what they could be. Um, I've got friends whose relationship with their mothers is just fractured. Um, And I look at all this stuff, and then that's the personal level. Then I look at the broader level, and I go, there's still kids who could be eating food, dying of starvation. There's people stuck in the sex trafficking industry, like going full global now. And I go from the global to the super personal relationship, relational, it's so obvious that something's not right. Mm-hmm. Like it's, how do you how do you look around and go? No, this is what the world was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Like you, I just, I can't see that being anyone's point of view. So I start there and I go, what does a life world live look like? Well, acknowledging that this actually isn't the way that it's supposed to be, which usually is an indicator to us that well, actually, then what is the way that this was designed to be? And from my worldview and from my faith, I genuinely am convinced that. This isn't the way that God created the world. It's not the way that he desired relationships to happen in marriages, in friendships. It's not the way that he desired human interaction to go. So a life well lived is finding every opportunity to turn the world that is into the world that, in my language, God desires it to be. But in other language, um, the world that we can see just isn't right at the moment and doing everything we can in the personal and in the global to go, actually, what could the world look like um, Mm. if it wasn't like this? If Mm. When when something's broken, we go, um, well, what's the ideal? And I think, for me, I'm just going, in every interaction, whether it's a conversation with the Domino's guy that gives me my pizza on Friday nights, or it's in quality time with my wife or playing with my kids or doing a good job at work I'm just going what does it look like for me personally to take responsibility for my sphere Mm -hmm. and going I just want to operate in this world as as boring and bland as it sounds righting the wrongs going I want to work for what I believe God desired this world to be Mm -hmm. which is so different to what it is at the moment I think and you're saying you don't need a big platform to be able to do that you don't you don't need a platform i'm going to go out on a limb and say you don't need a smoke machine okay you don't need from my experience you don't actually need a five-year bible college degree you don't need a title um i'm learning that i just need a willingness to 
and a, and a humility and a security to go, I'm okay. And if nobody finds out the good that I do in the world, that's okay. Because I just want to be a part of restoring what I believe the world was meant to be like. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So where does your reward come from then? Where's the satisfaction if no one knows? Yeah. So for me, my relationship with Jesus is I'm convinced that uh, he lived this way. He genuinely didn't seek the crowd. He didn't seek the fame. And he's made a promise that that, um, that which I'm not rewarded for on earth, um, I've made a decision to believe that I'll be rewarded for in eternity. And that can kind of sound out there and kind of weird, but I, I'm finding great joy in the here and now when I... I represent Jesus well, and when I um, right a wrong, when I start going, actually, I think this is the way that life's meant to be lived, treating people well, honoring people, mm. and I don't get rewarded for it. I actually find great joy in that, when nobody knows yeah. that um, I've contributed in some way, and I'm, I hope I don't look back in 10 years going, oh, I was wrong again. <laughs> I hope that 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 I could live like this for quite a while, yeah. doing in secret the really important things. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Luke. It's thanks, been a, Tom. Been a pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate being here. Uh, thanks, Luke, for sharing so honestly and and getting us thinking. I encourage you to go beyond just listening to sharing a thought or a question you have in the comments. Get a conversation going so that we can really explore these issues in a deeper way together. Like Luke said, sharing truth in love. So don't shy away from, from being honest. I had a great conversation via email with someone, one of you, this week and really got me thinking in ways I wouldn't have otherwise. So there's always power in, in a conversation, in putting yourself out there a bit and sharing a thought. I hope that you'll find uh, this a very safe place where you can do that. Um, check out our website if you're looking for other ways you can connect. Please also, before you go, think about somebody else that might benefit from hearing this interview and please consider sharing it with them. Otherwise, I hope that you'll be able to join us in our next podcast.